Good morning team, my name is Arvind Sangwaya, I'm one of the consultants in gastroenterology and acute medicine at Ealing Hospital. This talk is about an upper GI bleed, how to approach a patient and how to manage such patients as part of acute take or during an inpatient hospital stay. As we all know that upper GI bleed or acute upper GI bleed forms a very important part of any medical curriculum and is commonly seen medical urgency or emergency. Uh, if you are working in a district general hospital or a teaching hospital, you would see about 10 to 30 percent of the take at any given time to have patients coming in with an upper GI bleed. So let's talk about how to approach a patient with an upper GI bleed in the first instance. It's very important to understand the definitions and the terms that are being used. Unfortunately, these terms are used very loosely with interchangeable interchangeability amongst them. To have consistency amongst medical fraternity and as part of communication to your colleagues, it is very important to stick to a standard definitions that we use for, to describe patients with upper GI bleed. The commonly used terms, as you might have seen, are hematemesis, melina, hematochezia, or occult blood. This is to show you a pictorial as to how melina looks like and what the fresh red blood could look like. Uh, when you see a patient with an upper GI bleed, there are differential diagnoses or potential causes for an upper GI bleed, which in more than 50% of the cases is due to peptic ulcer disease. This can still be subdivided into a gastritis, duodenitis, erosions, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers. Esophageal viruses, on the other hand, are due to portal hypertension and account for 10 to 20% of the presentations. Gastric viruses are uncommon, but are also included in portal hypertension. Meliorized tear that happens at the gastroesophageal junction account for about 5%, esophagitis to 3 to 5%, malignancies, and deolefoil lesions which is a submucosal artery that intermittently comes up and bleeds. Nasopharyngeal cause of upper GI bleed is due to swallowed blood and can mislead the clinicians unless it's actively sought for. The other uncommon causes of upper GI bleed are aortoenteric fistula, angiodysplasias, arteriovenous malformations, or portal hypertensive gastropathies. This is to show you roughly what the percentages look like, and as you can see, vast majority of the patients would have duodenal ulcers, gastric erosions, or gastric ulcers as a possible cause, followed by varices, duodenitis, esophagitis, and then the others. Now, peptic ulcer disease is pretty common. This picture shows you that the endoscopic views of patients coming in with a peptic ulcer disease. There are subclassifications, and these are endoscopic endoscopically how to describe these ulcers. This is part of forest classification. And this gives you the chances of re-bleed. We would not expect the acute medical team to figure out how and how to classify the ulcers because this is an endoscopic classification. But bearing in mind that peptic ulcer disease by far would be the most common cause. Varices and deulofoil lesions are also commonly seen during examinations endoscopically. And these are further pictures to show you how the bleeding can look like during an upper GI endoscopy, with picture number one showing you the varices that are actively bleeding and picture number two showing gastric varices. These lesions Particularly, the varices can further be divided according to the sarin classification, whether they are esophageal or gastric. Depending on that, we can subclassify and risk stratify them and give treatment. Arteriovenous malformations are also seen, as you can see the red dot at about 3 o'clock position in the center, and these are the vascular causes. Malarivised tear is commonly seen in the gastroesophageal junction and is followed by retching or profuse vomiting, carries a classical history and endoscopically can look like it's been shown in the picture. Medicines induced upper GI bleed can look like ulcerations and can be incredibly difficult to say 
whether this was due to non-steroidals and careful history is paramount in these patients. Coming to that, now bearing in mind the causes that you have actually seen, uh, the differentials that you would actually expect, it is very important to take a full history from these patients. Detailed history would guide you as to what the differential diagnosis in these patients could be. Past medical history and surgical history are also important, particularly important in case the patient has had surgical interventions either recently or in the past because they can present to you with upper GI bleed. Social history, particularly focusing on use of alcohol and non-steroidals, either in the past or in recent past, is again very important. Check for comorbidities, particularly coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, malignancies. When you initially see a patient or have been asked to see a patient with an upper GI bleed, initial evaluation of patients should include airway breathing and circulation like you would do in any patient or assessment of any patient. Can the patient protect the airway? Is the patient having hematemesis? Is the patient having nosebleeds? Is the airway protected and does it need urgent protection? Can the patient breathe or does the patient need any breathing support? Is the patient hemodynamically stable? Vitals of the patient, which includes pulse, blood pressure, temperature, saturation of oxygen, respiratory rate, becomes extremely important. Make sure that the patient has had two large bore IV cannulase, has got Foley's catheter to monitor the urine output, and the basic initial assessment should all focus around initial assessment and resuscitate, resuscitate, and resuscitate. Patients can lose about 15% of their circulating volume without any change in the vital status. And this is very important to understand that young patients can have massive blood loss, yet have no change in their vital status. Is, the patient, is your patient in shock? And this can be assessed by checking their orthostatic status. So if the patient's got postural drop, this suggests the patient has had a large volume blood loss and becomes absolutely vital to replace the circulating volume. Once the initial vital assessment has been done, it is also important to assess for any stigmata of other disease. Has the patient got any liver disease? Has the patient got features suggestive of decompensated chronic liver disease? Has a patient had previous surgeries? Has a patient previously had malignancies? Has a patient recently had an endoscopic intervention like ERCP that could possibly explain an upper GI bleed? Could there be an ENT source of the GI bleed? Drug history becomes extremely important again to say if the patient has been on any anti platelet agents, are the patient anticoagulated? Are the patient anticoagulated with the newer agents? Or is the patient on warfarin? Does the patient have any bleeding disorders like hemophilia that you need to consider? So all this becomes important. Initial investigations should definitely include the full blood count, the kidney function test, the liver function test, and have a group and save for these patients. Clotting would tell you if there is any underlying clotting abnormality needs to be checked. ECG becomes absolutely vital in initial assessment of and investigations because 13% of the patients having massive upper GI bleed and are admitted to intensive care unit would also have an acute coronary syndrome. And another 12% of patients with a massive upper GI bleed would have myocardial infarctions. Chest x-ray becomes important to see if the patient's got aspiration or has a patient perforated or has got free air under the diaphragm. There are various scores that people have used. Two most commonly used scores are the Rocco and the Glasgow Blatchford. But the basic parts of including any scores involves two things. One is a clinical assessment, which you can do in the initial Exam history taking and examination of the patient, and the second one is endoscopic, which the scoring system is done during or after the endo endoscopy has been performed. So the clinical status of this patient includes age, hemodynamic instability, 
comorbidities, hematemesis, or coagulopathy. The endoscopic features include either the patient having a low-risk endoscopic findings or a high-risk endoscopic findings. This would in turn help you in the future management of this patient and to predict the outcome. So as we were talking about, the two most commonly performed scores are the Rockall and the Glasgow Blatchford. The Rockall score helps and attempts to identify patients at risk of adverse outcome and would be a marker of mortality. Whereas the Glasgow Blatchford predicts the need for treatment where a low Glasgow Blatchford score would suggest that no inpatient management or treatment is needed and a high score uh, would predict that the patient has actually got, uh, is going to require either blood transfusion or inpatient intervention like upper GI endoscopy. Once you have risk stratified the patient and understood the severity by using these scoring systems, if the patient has got a massive life-threatening and upper GI bleed, please call the major hemorrhage call. This would initiate a rapid response that should include your medical team, your surgical team, your anesthetic team, and alert the transfusion department to be ready. As part of the medical team, you should ensure that the patient has got two large bow IV cannulas and has got fluid resuscitation going, which initially should be with blood and colloid if needed. You should be able to tell from the history and from previous past medical history and or surgical history whether the patient A, requires any cl clotting factors, whether they require any reversal of the anticoagulants, and consider platelet transfusion if the patient has required large volume blood. You should continue to monitor for any ongoing blood loss and escalate it to the, your on-call gastroenterology team in your local hospital. As you have seen from the differential diagnosis, by this time you should be able to predict whether the patient has got an upper GI bleed due to a peptic ulcer disease, a liver disease, over anticoagulation, post-surgical, post-intervention. It is initially recommended that if you have seen patients that you can start these patients on proton pump inhibitor. This should be given in form of intravenous therapy and keep your patient nil by mouth. For varices, you can start patients on terlipressin after adequately fluid resuscitating the patient and giving them IV antibiotics. Once the patient is stabilized, you should contact the upper GI team in your local hospital for an urgent endoscopy. The discharge destination from the initial resus department should be based on the stability of these patients. Massive upper GI bleed usually require intensive care admission so that they can be monitored and managed quite aggressively. The upper GI bleed diagnostic procedures that are performed are the OGD, uh, upper GI endoscopy. It has got 95% diagnostic accuracy if it's done within the first 24 hours. The other modalities, if the upper GI endoscopy has not shown a source of bleeding could be an angiogram, which can be in form of a CT angiogram, which is diagnostic, or followed by a therapeutic angiogram once the bleeding source has been identified. The intervention radiology department should be able to help you with embolization if it can, the upper GI endoscopy cannot control the bleed. The CTs or intervention radiology or an angiogram can detect bleeding rate of more than 0.5 mils per minute. So your patient has to have a degree of active bleeding for these tests to pick it up. The other tests include technetium labeled RBC scans, which is usually done for occult bleeding where you have not found an obvious source on initial upper GI endoscopy or a CT angiogram or intervention radiology. There are special interventions that are that we can try, which is a Senstarkin tube and a Dennis Ellis stent to control bleeding, particularly for varices. Surgical referral should be sought if you have a recurrent or a refractory bleeding that cannot be stopped.
or you have an inability to identify a bleeding source. So in summary, the patients, it's very important to understand that as part of a general medical unselected take, you are going to see upper GI bleeds, which is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. There are risk storing systems in place which are quite accurate that can predict the prognosis of these patients. Good history and clinical examination are absolutely necessary when you are assessing these patients and risk stratify these patients early, followed by resuscitation, resuscitation, resuscitation and contact for an early endoscopy. So take home messages are, please take a proper history. Initial assessment should include airway breathing circulation. Please remember to keep your patient nil by mouth. Make sure they are not being fed because they may require an urgent or early endoscopy. Make sure that the patient has got two large bow IV cannulas and you contact your local upper GI endoscopy department in, in good time.